last presentation was about the BP DGRF. DGRF is, uh, as we heard, the interface between a modem chip and an RFIC typical. It could be, could be an uh, application processor too. But the DGRF deals with the main data stream going on the uptake and downlink on a mobile platform. The RFFV uh, or BP RFFV standard is different because it doesn't deal with the data stream on, on the link. It deals with supporting how this data stream is, is processed. So let's, uh, let's first slide here where we can see where it actually lives. It would, uh, the DIGRF would live between the modem and the RFIC, whereas the RFFV uh, essentially lives in the front end. And the purpose of the standard is to align, control, and synchronize all those components. And this becomes increasingly important as we add bands and new standards to the front end. So it says here, it enables the future RF front end. The, the, the issue we are facing is that uh, traditionally there, there has been no standard. So this is really a new area where, where um, to address. There has been no standard that can control on one bus many different types of devices in the front end. So typically time critical information uh, such as uh, real time programming and, and, and such is what this bus will deal with. It also has to be compatible with all the requirements in the front end and in cell phones in general. And as we all know, some of those are device compatibility. You cannot have too many pins. Um, it has to be a very compact silicon implementation or you will, you will add too much cost to your, to your implementation. Scalability, of course, and, and the ever-important low current consumption and, and power down and all this is, uh, is uh, critical. So some devices that can benefit from RFFV implementation would be RFICs, of course. This is usually the, the suspect for the RFFV master uh, on the bus. Uh, DC DC converters, if you're using them, uh, PAs, PA modules, of course, switches, another uh, good device, LNAs, antenna tuners, and other sensors you have in the front end. So the, basically the, the RFFV would serve as a network, internal network, if you want, in the front end, uh, and channeling information, time critical information at, at, uh, to the right point at the right time. So let's take a look at the scope and, and charter. The charter is very similar to um, all the other standards. But look at the scope. Uh, evaluate a low complexity solution compatible with today's mature semiconductor processes used in front end components. And uh, it also deals with looking into future process and RF front end architecture to ensure this interface has a long life. It will have a long life because this is the starting point. And we are seeing those requirements come up where uh, current current solution simply does not scale. So we need a bus which is a one bus that has a multi-drop if you want and can, can handle many devices. It has to support at least the following type of components, uh, PAs, front end switches, DC DC converters, LNAs and tuners. Uh, it deals with the physical interface, the protocol, command sets, noise impact of the interface. Very important point because uh, this is even closer to the antenna or the radio than the RF in, in a sense um, because you're right at the antenna, even possibly including the antenna. So you cannot generate too much noise but you might al must also be um, somewhat noise immune so you, the, the high currents just in, in influence your signal. So that's taken care of. and. Uh, the scope was also try to reuse existing MIPI standards if possible, and uh, you will learn later in this presentation that the RFFV is actually a subset of the SPMI spec. The SPMI spec is way more complicated than, than this really quite simple standard that uh, the RFFV is. So uh, this is the technical overview. Um, we have, um, it's targeted as we said for timing critical control such as band and mode selection. So from goes from 850 to PCS maybe, and this bus will align all the components that needs to be, be uh, 
change to settings on. Based on MIPI SPMI, we mentioned that it's a two-wire bus, and this is welcome for people who uh, don't have enough pins on their chips. So two wires, there is no enable, essentially there's a device ID instead. So we have a bi-directional data and a master clock, and that's it. Uh, data can go both ways, uh, but it has to be initiated by the master. There is um, broadcast capabilities and group triggers. This is uh, this is to facilitate events that have to happen at the exact same time. So you can essentially preload devices, um, basically tee them up, and then when you send out the group trigger, you will trigger the same commands, the same set of commands on all the on devices. And it's really important that things have to happen, have to happen fast on many devices uh, at the same time. We talked about the, the EMI um, clock frequency is tied together with EMI. You can run up to 26 megahertz clock frequency. Uh, I don't think it's specified in the bus, but um, up to 26. And you can use up to 15 slave devices per bus master. So take a look at the alternatives, and uh, this is just to put it in perspective. Uh, we all know SPI, very common, three, four, maybe five pin interface. Uh, very implementation specific, so in essence, one spy will not, or very rarely, work with another spy. And I square C is much more common, a very well defined standard. Uh, not very common for RF components, however, and uh, there are no triggers and it's very slow. Uh, parallel logic control lines uh, is maybe, together with analog signals, the most common um, way to control front ends today. But they do not scale, and uh, there is no real industry standard. So, really, there is no alternative to the RFFE standard, uh, as you can see. So, at the same time, uh, on the left, we have um, an increase in development in front ends where they become ever more complex. Uh, phones have to have more and more bands and standards that they have to support. So, there is an increasing need for a standard like this. So um, there is really, if you look at the last bullet, there is really no alternative that offers the scalability, economy, and compatibility of the RFFE standard. Uh, looking at the timeline, this working group, it, this is really a quite fast development program, I must say. So in September 08, working group was created. That's not that's not long ago. Um, the um, what was approved by MIPI board director in October 08. The technology selection was done in December the same year. In April 09, there was a first specification draft up for review, and technical approval was October last year. The current release, which is now in board review, was uh, brought out in May this year, and we expect widespread deployment during 2011, the standard. So, Looking at the working group, we have, uh, how are we doing on time? Are we good? Um, contributing companies are listed, uh, and I want to mention some key RFFE personnel that have been working on this uh, standard. The RFFE chair is Jory Arakoski from uh, Nokia. We have the vice chair, Kim Ross, Skyward Solutions. Uh, Gerald Huber from Infineon, is back there. He has been uh, doing the master editing master editor of the document. Uh, Morgan Set is the uh, marketing representative and Rob Anhofer as service of program manager. Uh, group has been have have held uh, quarterly workshop, weekly conference calls and extra meetings as needed to to bring the standards to where it is today. And uh, usually, usually we have a five weeks release review cycle. Any additional information, you can email Mippy or Rob, and uh, we'll set you up with a contact person. Thank you.